Hello, everyone. I'm Knut Berger. Thanks for joining us to celebrate season five of Mossbacks Northwest, which will premiere on KCTS 9 on December 9th. That's next Thursday. Th <clears throat> next Thursday. Um, with us tonight is uh, senior video producer Stephen Haig. And before we get started, I want to mention that we have a live audience consisting of KCTS and Crosscut uh, members in the studio tonight, but also a lot of folks joining us virtually. So bear with us as we navigate this new hybrid event thing. Uh, tonight, we'll be hosting a brief uh, Q&A at the end of the event. Folks in the studio, you can see <clears throat> how to submit questions on the screens to your right and left. Uh, virtual attendees can just type their questions into the chat box on the screen and they'll be magically transmitted to us here in the studio. Uh, we'll also be doing a raffle for a limited edition Mossback bobblehead. I don't know what it means. I, I haven't won a Pulitzer Prize or <clears throat> anything, but I, I have been bobbled. And... Uh, <clears throat> So we'll be uh, raffling off a couple of those for the studio audience. And then we'll be randomly choosing some of the online viewers, uh, at least one, uh, who will receive notice by email tomorrow that they've won, a random uh, number pick. So let's get started tonight. We'll be talking about the new season of the show. And let's watch a preview of what we have in store for you. The Northwest's greatest historian is back. More akin to Superman, Wonder Woman, or Spider-Man. It's a new season of the best stories from where we live. Do we in the Northwest have a history of sea monsters? Mossback's Northwest. Is he folklore? See the neighborhood in a whole new way. It's just possible, you know. All new Mossback's Northwest. Premiering December 9th on KCTS 9 and streaming at kcts9.org. He left his clip-on tie behind. <laughs> well, good evening, Knut. <laughs> good evening, Stephen. This is fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Um, where did this series, where did you get the idea for this series? And where is the den? First question first. Okay. Where did it come from? Where did it come from? So uh, when Crosscut, the website, merged with KCTS 9, back uh, about six years ago, actually, um, somebody uh, came to me from the KCTS side and said, uh, we think you'd be good on TV. And I was like, you're nuts. <laughs> uh, and they said, well, if you were to do a TV thing, what would you like to do? And I said, well, I would like to do what I do in, in my writing, which is kind of connect some current events with history, they said they wanted to do uh, short, you know, short bits that could run between other shows. And uh, interstitials is the technical term. And, uh, <clears throat> and I said, I'd like to maybe make artifacts or a historic photograph or something, have a prop, a visual aid to kind of help tell these stories uh, and, and show off some of the uh, you know, some of the relics of the region. So that's, that's how it started. And uh, where is the famous den? So, okay, it's, I'm just telling you guys, <laughs> don't advertise this. Um, the den is right here in this building. It's a conference room. It's a conference room that's dedicated to two producers who died um, in an accident uh, many years ago. And it's kind of a, a natural shrine. We call it the tree house. And it has some trees and murals on the wall and a big, beautiful kind of burled table that I, I, I used. And so it's, it's a place where people could kind of go for contemplation, but we, <laughs> we moved a bunch of cameras in there and uh, turned it into the Mossback Den. And uh, yeah, it's a really wonderful little spot. And when we're not shooting the show, we have meetings in there, or so we used to. The um, one of the questions that I get all the time is, 
where did the hat, the hat thing and the plaid thing start? When did you dream that up? Uh, well, I think we have a photograph that might answer that question, do we? Oh, early. <laughs> a very early idea. Yes, uh, this isn't a new thing. Uh, this picture was taken in our Mount Baker home where I grew up in the Mount Baker neighborhood, part of the Rainier Valley. And, uh, you know, I'm, the suspenders, the jeans, <laughs> the expression, <laughs> and the hat. You know, and I mean, I mean, kids in, in that era, this is probably taken in 1955 or something around there. You know, I mean, we wore jeans and flannel shirts. Um, I had a thing for hats, uh, which you wouldn't think with this hair. It's like the hair is enough of a hat, right? But, and it, it doesn't always look good with a hat on hair like this. But uh, I, I just felt as a child that if you were playing pretend, you couldn't pretend to be anything unless you had the right hat. The hat made the outfit. The hat made the outfit. If you wanted to be a soldier, you had to have a helmet. If you wanted to be a cowboy, you had to have a cowboy hat. And I still feel that way. You know, so I like to put the you... hat on to, to be able to turn a channel. How many hats do you have? I have no idea. Oh. I, have, I have many hats. But most of the hats in the show are my hats or hats I will acquire to match the subject. But I've it's, a, it's actually hats. a good thing. So when I, when, I'm, when I or Dave Quantic, our editor, are looking through lots of footage, we know which episode we're on by the hat, usually. <laughs> so you've... You're a historian. You've written about Pacific Northwest history and other things for a very long time. You know a lot about history, but you've written it. How is it to all of a sudden jump into a, a visual realm, a video realm, you know, especially with people, you know, producers who want to stick in real cockamamie ideas? You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, let's bring in a dinosaur here. That'd be really fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, writing feels often like and I'm sure the writers in the room, I mean, it feels often like a very solitary activity. It's you and you're thinking really hard and you're doing research and then you're typing, uh, you know, on your, on your laptop or whatever. This is so much more of a shared st storytelling. I mean, I write the scripts. I give voice to the script. You coach me through that. You know, oh, be a little more enthusiastic there. Or, you know, you, you mispronounce Dial that word. Up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, that, you know, that part is, is me. And I help do some of the research on visuals and stuff. But it's a, it's a collaboration. I mean, Stephen is the producer, director, researcher. He goes out looking for film clips and, and things that, that might match. Uh, he comes up with some of the ideas for stories. And, uh, and then we have an amazing editor yeah, uh, um, for the series. David Quantic sitting right there. And David, I, I just want you to wave or stand up, please. Um, because that really is, it's a cliche, but it, it's true. It, that's where the magic happens. And Dave takes our ideas, our scripts, and he really has a global view of it and he looks at it and he fashions the music which i usually pick uh but sound effects uh the backgrounds just the tone and texture of how each episode uh should feel like look like taste like smell like and i can't tell you how important that is and uh in, in the process um you know, I think yeah. I can speak for you, and often I will go down. I mean, I have a pretty good idea what he's going to do because we're we're trading ideas all the time. But then he'll show me a draft, and I'll look at it, and I'll go, "Wow, yeah." Not only is it different, but it's fantastically different. Yeah, yeah, so, it's it, yeah, it's really amazing because the visual storytelling is so much a part of so much a part of it. You know, it's something that you really don't unless you're working for National Geographic. You know, print doesn't really do the the storytelling justice. I know, I know. Dave always likes to look for movement, you know, through the story, and so I've learned a lot about storytelling by working with you guys. It's really fun. What's the hardest thing about being on camera? Um, 
Well, um, I would say the hardest thing is the repetitive stuff. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'll give you an example. We had an episode about the outlaw Harry Tracy, you know, this very bad guy who broke out of a penitentiary in Oregon and, and it was the subject of the greatest manhunt uh, in the state's history. This is at the turn of the century. And he was kind of the last of the Old West outlaws that was in this area. And we sh were shooting the, uh, the segment over in um, Eastern Washington. And uh, well, and I'll just tell this part of the story was um, we were filming it on a ranch where he was shot. He was hunted down and shot in a in a barley field in Creston, Washington, in Lincoln County, if you know where that is. But, you know, the challenge is the kind of repetition of stuff. You know, the repetition of, um, you know, saying your lines and then Stephen go, ah, that didn't have enough life in it. Do it again, you know, and then you do it again. And then he's like, okay, well, just stand a foot over this way and do it again. And well, you know, the shadow is not right. So look at, look this way and do it again. And so you go through this thing time after time, you know, and your feet are aching. It's not like you can complain because you're doing something that's really fun. But at the same time, it's like, again, really, again. And then, and then the cameraman always says, and once more for safety. <laughs> so. I haven't brought out my writing crop, though. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. I, I wanted you to wear a beret tonight. So um, I, I do remember we were shooting uh, in Palouse, and um, Knut was wearing a giant hat. And the hat was really not sized for him, but it, the, it, the type of hat was, in fact, it's here tonight. Someplace, yeah, you'll, isn't it? you'll see the hat tonight uh, when we get to the raffle. But it looks so good, but it was, you know, it was so big. It had to sit just right on his head. We're out in a wheat field and, and, it, and it, on a slope. So he's trying to navigate the slope and the hat is so big that it'll slip a little bit. I'll go, no, 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 no. Bring it back a little bit. Can't see your eyes. And then he has to walk towards camera and deliver a line and making sure the hat just stays where it's supposed to stay. That was, that was a tough one. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I mean, it, you get those things where it's like the only way to keep the hat on your head, it, it casts a shadow on your face. You yeah. know, if, if we were Hollywood, we would have had it sized. Writers but, don't have to put yeah. up with that. Yeah. Right. I mean, we can dress how we want, obviously. Do you, do you have a favorite episode? And I know that's an unfair question. Uh, but in seasons three and four, uh, the previous seasons, and why? What? I have a couple of, I mean, I have a lot of favorite episodes. Um, but, well, uh, the one particular favorite is actually one that was Stephen's idea, which was to uh, profile uh, Sir Thomas Beecham, the conductor, a famous, world famous conductor who found himself in Seattle as conductor of the Seattle Symphony during World War II. And, you know, he was a character, he, he was independently wealthy because his family invented a laxative, Beecham's pills. So he, I mean, literally constipation was the source of his uh, fortune, which allowed him to uh, start and conduct orchestras and that kind of thing. And he's famous for one main thing, which was he, uh, He's the one who called Seattle an aesthetic dustbin. And he actually meant it as a positive, encouraging comment because he said to the Chamber of Commerce, uh, you know, I would be tired of being considered an aesthetic dustbin. But he was a very kind of crabby, contentious guy. And, and, um, and so Seattle got tagged with this idea that it morphed into cultural dustbin. And we've had this kind of our insecurity ever since. So I love that episode because it, it, it had all these unexpected elements. And we found music that Beecham had conducted. And it, when it was put, uh, film footage and the music was put, um, uh, the, the points of music matched the conductor in ways that made points that we wanted to make. It was really a, a fun episode. Again, you know, Dave Quantic's. Yeah. Any anything else that? that... Well, one of my <clears throat> favorite episodes, I think, is the story of uh, George Bush, mm. not the president, 
um, not, not the other president, uh, but George Bush, the pioneer, black pioneer who was really the key, triggered the American settlement of Puget Sound. And, uh, you know, he, he came out to uh, the Northwest, to Oregon. And when he got here, he was a, a free black who um, you know, was fairly well-to-do. He, he, he could afford a covered wagon and all the money and supplies that that took and came out and found that Oregon had passed the so-called Lash Law. And this was a law that was passed that, that banned people of color from Oregon, the Oregon Territory, and said, you will be lashed until you leave. Now, that law was changed, but not really for the better. Well, when he got here, he was like, well, I'm not going to put up with that. So they went north of the Columbia, and he, he founded what's now Tumwater. And uh, we, I found that some Evergreen State College students had been out there on the original homestead and had dug up some wonderful artifacts of this pioneering family. And uh, his... Uh, son, Owen Bush, mm -hmm. went on to become not only the first uh, black state legislator, but he became famous for his wheat varieties and uh, passed the legislation that started what's now Washington State University. So this was a family with a multi-generational huge impact. They're very, they're not very well known. Uh, just last week, they put up a, 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 a plaque to George Bush in Olympia on the Capitol campus there. It's an amazing story. And that was one where I learned a lot. And we had these cool artifacts from the homestead to show off. And I think I liked it. We're, we're, we are both very interested and we're, we feel responsible for telling the, uh, the, the stories of our diverse uh, history and diverse peoples, uh, although it's somewhat hard to do sometimes because their histories aren't recorded in the same way that a lot of other people's are, but it that also makes it a very fun challenge. I really love the story that you wrote about Harry Allen, the turn of the century trans youth who lived his life uh, the way he wanted to live it um, and became kind of a spectacle um, for better, for worse. Yeah, I mean, the, the people at the time and the newspapers just did not know what to make of a, a, trans, a trans man. Um, he even got married. Uh, he was, there was scandal, you know, uh, he was subject of so many newspaper stories. It's a, it's a tragic story, but it's also fascinating because it's in many ways so modern. And, um, and now Harry Allen is, you know, in books and, and studies of, um, uh, you know, the kind of gender identities on the frontier, which were far more complicated than than we like to think. You know, we have the John Wayne image or the Oregon Trail sort of image, but it, it, it was a much more complicated environment. How does, a, how does the story come together? I think that's an interesting uh, thing because n no two stories are the same, but usually you, you write an, a script either one of us will come up with an idea and you, you write a script. Um, and then the next thing that happens is uh, we kind of start doing some preliminary research. Yeah. I mean, you know, for my part of it, um, I have to find something where I feel I could tell something new. My, my goal is even if you think, you know, everything there is to know about Northwest history that, um, you're going to watch the episode or whatever, and you're going to go, wow, I had no idea. I had no idea. Um, and of course, that's hard. There are a lot of stories that are really well known. As you mentioned, there are other histories that are very hard to find, or if you find them, you don't have the visual elements to bring to them, so you have to get creative or, or do something else. I think the stories that appeal to me always have something in them that make it a story, that make it this isn't exactly what you thought it was. Mm -hmm. This person isn't exactly who you thought they were. If, if, if it has that element, and in, in, you know, in that case, there's some 
big stories that we've told ourselves that are really, you know, have really sugarcoated things or ignored, uh, you know, ig ignored context that's really important. So I always look too for context, you know, what is there uh, that we could bring to it to sort of say, well, why this is, why should this be interesting now? Um, I mean, the very first Mossback episode I did was with, um, it was when Jenny Durkin was elected mayor of Seattle, the first woman elected in a hundred years, only the second woman mayor of Seattle. And what was she facing? She was facing police reform. Well, guess what? Our first mayor, Bertha Knight Landis, she made her career on police reform. And in fact, when the, she was president of the city council and when the mayor was out of town, she fired the police chief. Oh, no. And this created a huge scandal. And we had this amazing artifact that went with it, which was that police chief's badge. It was made of solid gold and had a diamond in the middle. And when he was sworn in, it was given to him by the business community as basically a, you know who you're working for. And so it's, it, to me, it was fascinating that, you know, 100 years between these two women, uh, mayor bookends, and guess what? They're dealing with police issues. They're dealing with corruption. They're dealing with how the department, you know. And I just thought that makes a really interesting way to tell that story. And, of course, Bertha Knight Landis was an amazing <laughs> character in person. Quickly, um, and then we're going to enter. We, we have a little surprise. Um, okay. So after doing television, do you look at documentaries and television differently? Yes. I, um, so I'm a big fan of the British baking show. And uh, my wife and I love it. We watch it. And now I look at it and I'm like, how do they photograph all that? And there's no shadows. <laughs> and uh, I read an article in a British newspaper just this week from a former contestant. And he said that during the filming, there are sometimes is, you know, like a hundred staffers surrounding them, uh, filling the, you know, all the cables and lights and, and their producers going in and out. But you see none of that. When you watch the show, they're just 12 chefs and a couple of judges and it's all very clean. I really appreciate how difficult it is to make something look so simple. And, uh, yeah, it, it just blows my mind. So, yeah, I'm becoming a video bore when it comes to watching something. I'll, I'll constantly be saying to my wife, do you have any idea how hard it is to do that? <laughs> you know, that actor, can you imagine, like we were watching Succession, and I'm like, I can't believe they've got 10 actors in the room all talking and they know their lines, you know. I could barely read a prompter. Well, you might have heard that uh, season five of Mossbacks Northwest is upon us. It's going to start uh, airing broadcast on KCTS 9 next Thursday, this coming Thursday at um, 8.50 p.m. So we're going to show you the first episode. You're the only ones outside this building to see episode 501 from season five of Mossbacks Northwest. One of the Northwest's greatest mysteries is about a skyjacker who called himself Dan Cooper, more widely known as D.B. Cooper. On November 24th, 1971, Thanksgiving Eve, Cooper threatened to blow up a Boeing 727 bound from Portland to Seattle unless he was paid $200,000 in $20 bills. He sipped from a bourbon and soda, got the money and some parachutes, then jumped into history. To my mind, his outrageous crime is not even the most odd thing about his story. To this day, no one knows who D.B. Cooper was. The name he gave for his airline ticket was Dan. The name D.B. was said to be a media mistake, but it stuck. For the last 50 years, people have been trying to find Cooper 
not unlike Bigfoot hunters. People have fingered their relatives and neighbors. Deathbed confessions have been made. More than 800 suspects examined by the FBI. There are many theories, but no definitive DB. Let's quickly retrace the crime. Cooper, whoever he was, bought a single one-way ticket from Portland to Seattle for $20 on Northwest Orient Flight 305. On the plane, he slipped a note to the stewardess saying he had a bomb in his briefcase. This is back before airlines checked for such things. Seeing what looked like a bomb, the flight attendant conveyed to the captain that the man in his mid-40s of medium height and build with brown eyes and a black suit wanted the airline to cough up 200 k refuel the plane, and fly him to Mexico City. He wanted two parachutes with two reserve chutes, just in case. Why? It's thought that he wanted the authorities to think he might jump with a hostage so they wouldn't sabotage the chutes. The 727 landed in Seattle and the passengers and some of the crew were let off. The money was brought on board along with the parachutes and the plane took off with a refueling stop planned for Reno, Nevada. Cooper insisted they fly no higher than 10,000 feet. The remaining stewardess on board showed Cooper how to lower the aircraft's rear stairway. Then she left the cabin for the safety of the cockpit, leaving Cooper alone. When they landed in Reno, Cooper, a chute, its backup, the bomb, and the money were gone. The hijacker had jumped mid-flight somewhere between Seattle and Reno. He left his clip-on tie behind. A massive manhunt ensued with focus on southwestern Washington. It was theorized that Cooper must have been a former paratrooper or military man, even an airline employee. Searchers scoured the woods for his shoot and loot or his body. It was speculated that he went splat, jumping at night in high winds during a thunderstorm with cloud cover so he couldn't see the ground. He could have landed in the deep forest or the Columbia River. After the jump, the rest of us were left looking for answers. The FBI kept the case open, running down tips and leads. In 1980, a boy digging a fire pit on the Columbia River Beach on the Washington side at a place called Tina Bar dug up $5,800 in ratty, deteriorating $20 bills whose serial numbers matched those on DB's ransom money. The money was still bound in rubber bands. Cooper was a mainstay on the FBI's most wanted list, but in 2016, they announced that they were focusing their energies on other priorities. But he's still a wanted man. If Cooper landed safely, and if he's still alive, he'd be in his mid-90s by now. If he came forward, he'd be flush in celebrity and facing his twilight years in club fed. To me, the oddest thing about the D.B. Cooper case is the public response to it. After Cooper's, there were at least two dozen hijackings that featured copycat demands for ransom and parachutes. So while some people wanted to catch D.B. Cooper, many others dreamed of being D.B. Cooper. Back in 1971, when people first heard about him, he actually had a great deal of public sympathy. Only four days after the hijacking, an article in the Seattle Times collected the thoughts of what the person on the street in Seattle thought about the crime. A taxi driver told the paper's reporter, you've got to admit he was clever the way I see it. Anybody smart enough to take $200,000 just like that ought to make a clean getaway. An army private said, I hope he isn't caught. Such comments come with the context. The early 1970s were still largely the 1960s. Seattle was racked with the Boeing recession, anti-war protests and bombings. Around the world, skyjackings had become somewhat commonplace. More than 130 American planes were hijacked between 1968 and 1972. President Richard Nixon was reelected, but the Watergate scandal was gestating. Wars hot and cold raged. Social tumult had become a norm. Youth rebellion was still in full flower. Hippies abounded. And D.B. Cooper? Despite his dapper black suit and clip-on tie, cool shades, and a 
taste for bourbon and soda. The guy who pulled off a spectacular heist without anyone else being killed by a bomb or an overzealous SWAT team somehow embodied for many a cool anti-establishment rebel that many ordinary folks could envy. And like any great performer, D.B. Cooper made a dramatic and memorable exit that we're still talking about half a century later. Mossbacks Northwest is made possible by the generous support of Bedrooms and More. So why go back to D.B. Cooper? Seems like a well-worn story. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is, uh, <clears throat> except that, uh, you know, whole generations have have grown up and that don't know that story. I mean, I think a lot of people in this room might, but a lot of people don't know about D.B. Cooper. We found the same thing was true with the Kingdom. Right. Uh, uh, Stephen and I had Kingdom T-shirts, and when we would walk around, people would stop us, and either they'd say, oh, the Kingdom, we love the Kingdom, or they would say, what is that? And uh, so I thought it was fun just to 50th anniversary, kind of revisit it. But this element that was intriguing to me was, as I dug in and began researching, was, as we said in the show, um, you know, he was hero worshipped by all kinds of people. I mean, today he'd, you know, he'd be in Guantanamo or something. And yeah, hijackings were kind of a dime a dozen mm -hmm. for you know, a period of years there. And that's something we, I mean, we, you know, we think about people throwing tantrums on planes now over wearing masks or something, but, you know, it was a, it was a very rough and tumble period in our history. That's one of the things that we've talked about a lot is uh, an idea for a story. And it just seems all too familiar to, to us. Um, we both grown up in the Northwest. We're roughly the same age. But we forget, and this has happened more than once, there are about 200,000 people who have either moved to Seattle or to the area, or there are younger generations who have no idea of this thing that is so common to us. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you're just trying to uh, look, not, not take those things that were common touchstones for granted. Now, one more thing about the D.B. Cooper episode, and this is kudos, because uh, Stephen is kind of an airplane junkie, and so he had to find a 727. I, I don't have as many airplanes as you have hats. But... Yeah. <laughs> he had to find a 727, and, uh, and one with a working rear stairway. And, and not only that, so he, he ended up finding two one is at the Museum of Flight, right? And it and it has a perfectly preserved 1970s interior. I mean, it looks like it just rolled out. Yeah. But the stairway didn't work. But we found a junk, basically a junk 727 up in Everett that's used by Everett Community College to uh, train aircraft mechanics. And it had the working stairway. Otherwise, it was totally stripped out. You have to, once you, look, the, the stairway lowers by its own weight, it's gravity, but then you have to pump it up. It's like pumping a bicycle tire. I, you know, I would have thought, well, you just press a button. Zzz. No, we took turns pumping it up because we had to do, you know, well, we lots had, of takes. I was going to say, yeah, the poor guy who, who uh, you know, was helping us with that. You know, he kept having to close it, then pump it out again, <laughs> close it, pump it out. It was a lot of work. Another fascinating thing about the stairway of a 727 and the DC-9, if you remember those, is uh, because they had rear stairways, after D.B. Cooper, they had to find a way to, to keep a stairway from being deployed in flight. So that sounds complicated, but actually, no. It's just a little latch that's free floating and looks like it's just screwed in at the back of the airplane. And when the aircraft uh, uh, reaches a certain speed, the air, the air pressure just makes it close over the, uh, the stairway. So it's just like a window latch. Ingenious. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, talking about season five, 
let's um, let's give a few more clues. Okay. So we saw season. Uh, we saw episode one. Episode two has to do with creatures. You seem to be sort of enamored with creatures. <laughs> well, you know the Northwest is is full of mythology and legend uh, things that um, people were telling stories about before Europeans and Americans ever came here and settled. And uh, one of the things I've always been intrigued about, uh, and my father used to talk about Ogopogo, which is a uh, like the Loch Ness Monster up in Lake Okanagan in British Columbia. And so I thought, well, you know, what? I wonder kind of what our history of sea monsters is. And I had heard about a sea monster called Cadborosaurus. Have you guys, anybody here heard of Cadborosaurus? Well, Cadborosaurus has been seen many times in the Salish Sea, uh, starting in the 1930s and uh, continuing. There are books about Cadborosaurus. And so it just led me down this rabbit hole of of all these sea monster tales that, you know, are everything from Elliott Bay to the Powell River, uh, it, it, just a ton of them. And so it's it's sort of like, wow, we think about Sasquatch, but sea monsters, it's a thing. And of course, now we have the Kraken right here in Seattle. So, yeah, that was a good that was a that was a good starting point for this. Yes, monster. provided an entry point for the subject. Right. And then um, legends, you're very into legends, uh, especially legends that wear a plaid shirt. Yeah, yeah. well, we, we, uh, um, we, we did a couple of episodes this year that came from viewer comments or questions. Uh, so it was kind of fun to see, you know, something come in that, that turns out to be an intriguing thing. And so a school teacher had asked us if... Um, there were any Paul Bunyan stories about Seattle and Puget Sound. And I just thought, okay, I'll answer that, you know, and I did a little looking and found some stories. But as I dug into it more and more, I found out that there was this like big academic controversy over who Paul, who Paul Bunyan was, who made him up, if anybody made him up. Was he mythology? Or as they put it, was he folklore or fake lore? Well, I, you know, so I just ended up down this uh, fascinating thing about the history of Paul Bunyan and why he became so iconic in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, yeah, it was just that that is really a fun episode. I don't know about you. I grew up with stories about Paul Bunyan. I went to a summer camp where we had a Paul Bunyan campfire. We had a Paul Bunyan story about our summer camp. Um, I went to a camp uh, in, up in Snohomish County called Hidden Valley Camp. And every, every season we had a Paul Bunyan campfire and there was a creek there, there um, a pond that was our swimming hole that was full of brown, goopy water. And uh, the, the story was told that Paul Bunyan, that this was one of, uh, the, the pond had been created uh, by Babe the Ox, his companion's footprint, and that Paul was chewing tobacco and spat the juice into the into the <laughs> into the hoof print and said, "Hmm, ain't that purdy?" <laughs> so Purdy yeah. Creek was what Purdy we called it. And uh, anyway, I grew up with it, and that's another thing. You know, there's sort of a whole generation that knows about Paul Bunyan, and there's a generation that that doesn't really know, but he does show up in Marvel comics and video games, which is interesting. So, well, a couple of seasons ago, you did that, that episode about Northwest food, right? So you, we yeah. decided to uh, take off on that and do an episode about a salad. Yeah, this, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound very exciting, does it? An episode about a salad. Um, but I, again, this was from a reader who said, well, you did this food episode on foods that Seattle kind of made famous or originated, the Dutch baby, the frango mints, various things. Why did you not do anything about Crab Louie? And I was like, oh, really? Crab Louie's from here? 
And so I began researching that. And yeah, it, well, what I'll say is it, it took us down interesting pathways to sort of find out what the story of Crab Louie was, which of course turns out to be way more complicated than you would think. <laughs> but it took us to the Davenport Hotel in Spokane, and, uh, which claims to have originated Crab Louie, but they're not the only restaurant that claims to have originated Crab Louie. So there's quite a competition. That's, that's a, it's a, that's a yeah. fun sort of journey. It made me very hungry. So you remember the little dog that perished in the uh, collapse of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Yeah, Tubby. Tubby. Um, so we've decided we're going to do another episode about dogs, but this one is a little different. Yeah, this this episode uh, is about the no Northwest heroic dogs. And so we went back to uh, the Coast Salish and uh, but they've been brought that forward with various dogs that have played some kind of prominent role in Northwest history or started a journey here or came here. For example, Seaman, Lewis and Clark's Labrador, Black Labrador. It's the Newfoundland. only animal. Newfoundland, wasn't it? It was in, uh, sorry, Newfoundland. And uh, it's, the, it's the only animal that made the entire journey out and back with Lewis and Clark. And you might be interested to know that they, on the course of the expedition, the expedition members ate at least 200 dogs. But Clark wouldn't eat dog, although the dog belonged to Lewis. But it's just an example of this kind of amazing history about the dog that went with these guys that we that we learn about in school, but you never hear about the dog. So let's see. After dogs is a story of a, an amazing a, a, a house. Yeah, we have a uh, story about a, a house, but yeah. but the story is more than about than about the house. Yeah, yeah, it is, and um, we have a story about this amazing. Um, family, the Kate and Revels family, who um, uh, Susan Revels and, and Horace Caton Jr. ran, uh, uh, were African American. They ran a newspaper in Seattle that was had the second largest circulation of any newspaper in town. And uh, they were extremely successful. This was in the 1890s. And uh, so successful that they had they bought this beautiful Victorian house on Capitol Hill, and um, and, and flourished. They hosted people like Booker T. Washington and other notables at their home. Um, and then the family had this kind of painful and gradual fall, partly due to shifting racial attitude in Seattle in the in the years around 1910 to 1920, um, city that had seemed very tolerant and, and open to blacks in the 1890s changed very much. And their house is still standing. It's uh, the people who owned it wanted to uh, make it a landmark and preserve it. It's in remarkable uh, condition. But, um, and the family, also, um, the next generation of the family included some people who were very prominent in uh, the labor movement and, and in sociology and whatnot in trying to improve the life of African Americans in this country. So um, it's, it's a painful story, but it's also really inspiring. And there's a kicker to that story. I'm just going to tease you um, that um, you would have never dreamt would have happened, but yeah. Sorry, I'm a teaser. I'll leave it there. <laughs> um, and then we're we're doing a story about you probably heard about Edward Curtis, the famous Indian photographer, uh, who became very famous, very very famous by his uh, obsessive uh, forty year pursuit of capturing um, major tribes in North America on film, and did so very artfully. But he had a brother, Ashel Curtis, who was also a photographer. And Aishel's story in his uh, photographs 
is amazing. It's very different than Edwards, but it's it's we're paying homage to Aishel and that that's fun. And then finally, um, we're doing a musical. Here comes the brides. <laughs> So this is one of those stories I think a lot of people think they know. It's about the so-called Mercer girls, who weren't girls, they were women. And uh, they were essentially mail order brides who were brought to Seattle to marry the lumberjacks. And uh, they made a TV series. I don't know if you guys remember it from the 60s and 70s, but they made a TV series about it. Pure sugar coating. It's a much more interesting, complicated, and disturbing story than you've probably heard. Uh, so we have a chance to take that story, which is one of those fundamental Seattle stories, and dig deeper on it. And I think people will find that really fascinating. The bluest skies you've ever seen, that's a bunch of BS. Uh, okay, so now we get to the your question. So I hope you've all uh, been able to get online to the website and ask a question. And... Um, Let's see, from Bud and Tracy, what is the cornerstone book on our state or, or city, Seattle, you would recommend? Um, is there a single book you know, about the, our state that is yeah. a good, good comprehensive read? No, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> and, and it's very difficult. I mean, with Seattle, everybody points to Murray Morgan Skid Road or... Uh, Seattle Past to Present by uh, by Roger Sale. Uh, I ha I got to do the introduction to the latest edition of that. They're both they're both worth reading. They're both they both tell Seattle's story from very different perspectives. But I think the I think the definitive no book is going to be definitive. There've been a lot of really good sort of specialty histories on Seattle. Uh, Quintar Taylor's Forging the Black Community is a very important book. Cole Thrush's Native Seattle, very important book. David Berge's biography of Chief Seattle, super important book. Um, you know, there, there's an environmental history uh, by Matt, Matt Klingel on, uh, called The Emerald City, which talks about race and class in terms of how we shape the city. So there are a lot of really important books. And I think, I think it's important to kind of read a bunch of them. I, I think looking for one sort of story, I mean, that's kind of what we're learning about history is there are many narratives, there are many uh, frames. And uh, yeah, sort of the more the better. And uh, maybe someday somebody will write like a, the next definitive history, but not, not now. Was there a, an event or events that started you on your path as a historian? I just happened to grow up. Uh, my sister is here in the audience. Uh, and uh, we she's grew, wearing plaid, right? Yes, she is, as a matter of fact. Yeah. And, um, you know, we grew up in a household where we had a curio cabinet uh, full of strange historic objects, you know, a brick from Fort Sumter and whatnot. Uh, my, I, my maternal grandfather was a collector of all kinds of objects. Um, but they were often objects that he felt had been touched by history. You know, here's a tile from a cathedral where Joan of Arc walked, you know, that kind of thing. But there was just a real appreciation in our house of, of the past. And, um, you know, that was a big influence. My first book was when I was in, I don't know, third grade. It was a history of the Civil War, illustrated, you know. So I just was always interested in it. Why are so many Seattleites so seemingly apathetic about Seattle's rich history? That's a really great question. You know, I lived in the Bay Area for two years. And I lived in San Francisco for part of that time. And San Francisco is one of those cities where, like, you go into a bookstore to look at the local history section, and it's like an entire wall. And in Seattle, it's like a couple of rows, you know, of the bookstore. You know, San Francisco, it, it, it was just my experience of here's a city that's not that much older than Seattle, where you walk around that city and there are plaques on just about every building. You know, here's the first Filipino dentist, uh, you know, in San Francisco or whatever. I mean, they really get into it. And uh, 
and Seattle is a contrast with that. I think there's a way, and this is something I've written about before. I think a lot of people move to Seattle because they think it's a, they can, it's a blank slate. Bobby Kennedy came here in 1962 for the World's Fair, and he told the local business community, you are so lucky that you don't have a history. You don't have all the baggage we have back east. You can start the new frontier. It's all far forward. You have no backward. Well, that attitude is not good, you know. I mean, it makes you, yes, you have all kinds of entrepreneurial things, but you also have um, cultures that you overrun and, and destroy, um, as well as mistakes that you make repeatedly because you refuse to look backwards and think, ooh, you know, could we do better? Um, from Rebecca. Um, do you have plans for your archives? Wow. Uh, including ephemera and artifacts to go somewhere that will be accessible to the public in person on, and online. Okay, well, the online part of this, I just want to emphasize, I would, I would be without resources, without the digitization of historical materials, documents, photographs, and stuff during this pandemic. Uh, all the collections are closed. Many of them still are closed. Um, and I took my stimulus money and I sent it to all the local historical societies and the public library and whatnot and, and as a thank you for the digitization. I, I know digitizing stuff isn't the, all the answer. You need the physical stuff too. But without digitizing, you really don't have anything. Our family has, you know, we've talked as a family about uh, donating papers to the University of Washington. Um, I'm still working, active, still creating huge piles of junk in my house. Archives. Uh, artifacts, future artifacts. Um, so I'm not really ready to give up anything. Um, there is a little bit of a hoarder thing there. <laughs> yeah, in my house. I don't let them call it junk. It's, it's <laughs> archives. <laughs> But yeah, I, I, I would like uh, my stuff to go somewhere that where other people can take advantage because I've benefited from that. What is the coolest feature or building that we have lost in Seattle that you wish existed today? Ooh, that's, <laughs> that's a real, well, I'll tell you, and this is an odd one, but the clock tower at Coleman Dock. Oh, right. Yeah. You know, I think Coleman Dock, um, you know, where the ferry is and they've just modernized it, but it used to have this fabulous clock tower on it. And um, I've seen a photograph of Coleman Dock, Smith Tower, King Street Station, and you see these, this juxtaposition and, and from an architectural standpoint, it's like, no, there was a there was something going on here. There was like a dialogue, architectural dialogue going on mm. between these. And I, I just think it's unfortunate that we don't have that sort of um, iconic waterfront, you know, kind of tower. So I would want to see that back. Here's a really great question. I teach history to young people. Often their impulse is to cancel bad actors and unjust events. How do you make history relevant and righteous for young people? It's interesting because I've only been asked for my autograph once, and it was by uh, a six-year-old who loves Mossback. But I get letters from teachers all over who say that these shows, um, they use them in class. Um, and, and we're talking grade school and maybe junior high, middle school, which is like the biggest flattering thing I can imagine. And, um, you have to tell the whole story. You can't tell the whole story in every story, but you have to be willing to look at the difficult stuff. I mean, there's a lot of times when I look at our history, the Lash Law is a great example, and you just cringe. I mean, you just can't believe that people endured that, that people thought that, did that, and that that's part of your community. You have to look at it. I understand 
wanting to take down an, a statue that's inappropriate because that's a, that's a different thing. That isn't history, that's propaganda. And so, and, and times change. And I think the discussion around that stuff is really positive, no matter what the conclusion is. Um, but you can't leave out the bad. And then we've done that too much. That's mm -hmm. what we need to get over. Mm -hmm. um, history doesn't always tell you what you want to hear. Um, from Rebecca, what or where are some of your favorite Northwest archives that you delve into for research? Uh, well, I mentioned the University of Washington Special Collections. They're fantastic. Um, they're great people that work out there. And I did a whole series on uh, Nazis, actual Nazis, 1930s and 40s Nazis in the Northwest, particularly in Seattle. Nobody had done that before, done a story about that before. Um, although there was some in academic journals, but not, not in the popular history. And I found fantastic stuff, important court records at the Federal Archives at Sandpoint. The University of Washington has an amazing special collections uh, collection on the Silver Shirts, who were the American fascist movement of the 1930s. Um, and uh, another tremendous resource for that kind of thing is the Oregon Historical Society. Yeah, yeah. And um, which I am a supporter of, member of, um, they're, they're better than we are in, in terms of the archiving and publishing and uh, getting material out. Um, how did you choose the nickname Mossback? And incidentally, I, this year I heard the name Mossback used in the film It's a Wonderful Life. Yes, that's right, George. You're a Mossback. Of course, I never picked up on it before. But yeah. last year I went, yeah. it's like, George, you old Mossback. So, yeah, so uh, the, the term has been around for a long time, uh, and uh, it's been applied to somebody who's very conservative. Uh, it was a term applied to Confederate draft dodgers who, uh, you know, would be out in the swamps dodging the, the Confederate draft. Um, uh, you know, old fish with uh, seaweed growing on them are called mossbacks, like giant bass. Uh, or something of that kind. There's a clam called a mossback. Um, I came across it in a book um, that was a compendium of stories pioneers had written to the, uh, a newspaper in Tacoma in 1892, and it, it was uh, the con it was a contest. And the contest was send us your story of how you came out uh, to the Northwest in the pioneer period, and if uh, the winner will be sent to the Columbian exhibition in Chicago in a palace car. And so these people wrote these amazing first person stories about coming on wagon trains and coming around the horn and all the trials and tribulations. And in a number of accounts, they said, well, you know, we, we helped build this area and settle it. Uh, but nowadays, newcomers, newcomers, they come on trains and they call us mossbacks. It became a term of derision for sort of the original settlers. And uh, I was writing for Seattle Weekly at the time. And so I, I decided I was going to call my column mossback. Because I wanted to kind of claim regional identity. I'm, I'm from here. I choose to live here. I love this place. And I wanted to embrace it. My definition of Mossback, and there's actually an, a Mossback episode on what is a Mossback. But my definition isn't you had to be born here or anything like that. It's do you come here and does it resonate? And is it a place that you allow to change you? In other words, you don't just come here and see it as a blank slate and I'm going to, oh, I'm going to build a perfect city, a new Manhattan it's the kind of thing that you come to and you say, um, wow, I, this place is really has literally grown on me. I mean, we, you know, you park a gar, car in your driveway for a couple of years and you know Moss grows. <laughs> a couple of years. <laughs> a couple of months, yeah. So that's kind of where I came up with it. It was just a, just a way of declaring local loyalty, I guess. 
Well, we could go all night on we could. on this, but um, it's uh, this has been a great conversation. I just want to take one second and, you know, Dave Quantic, our editor, is a great member of the team, but so is Resty Bacall, who does most of the photography for us. <laughs> Resty and and our other crew people, Victoria and Andrew and Luciana. There's it is a collaborative thing, you know. I'm just kind of a project manager. Uh, we have some truly talented people here that really make it happen. Yeah, well, this has been really fun. Thank you for coming here tonight. I want to thank our members, many of whom are you know here in the studio. Um, and I want to thank you for supporting KCTS, for supporting Crosscut. We really appreciate it. We need it. We hope you'll enjoy the new season. Okay, it premieres on KCTS 9, December, a week from today, December 9th, 8.50 p.m. And they'll run once a week on Thursday at 8.50. So you can see them at a regular time. If you get the program guide, we're in the program guide. And it also shows when some of the episodes repeat before they go into kind of endless <laughs> repetition. Thank you again, and good night. Okay, oh, now. but wait, there's more. <laughs> yeah. Of course. We promised. The famous hat. We are going to. You need this. I'm just going to show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>